Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel called Statistics from A to Z, Confusing Concepts Clarified. These videos are based on content from my book of the same name, which is published by Wiley. For more information on the book and these videos, please visit statisticsfromatoz.com. This is the last of six, six planned videos on the subject of statistical tests. If you want to know the latest status of the videos I have been working on, please see the videos page on my website, statisticsfromatoz.com slash videos. As usual in the book and in these videos, we'll start by going quickly through a list of keys to understanding or KTUs. This will end up with the highlights of the concept on a single page. And then we'll go into detailed explanations of each of the keys. For this video, there are five KTUs. The first key to understanding tells us that non-parametric NP statistical methods have no requirements about the shape of the distributions from which the samples are collected. The second KTU says non-parametric methods convert measurement data into signs, ranks, signed ranks, or rank sums. Key number three says non-parametric methods can work with ordinal data, for example, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and non-parametric methods work with medians instead of means. Key to understanding number four says, NP methods work better than parametric methods in dealing with outliers, skewed data, and small samples, but NP methods have less power. And the fifth key to understanding is this table of five common non-parametric tests, showing what each does and what its parametric counterpart is. We'll go through this in detail. And here on one page are the five keys to understanding the concept of non-parametric. You may wish to pause the video at this point and read them all together. Okay, now let's take a closer look at each key to understanding. Key number one says non-parametric NP statistical methods have no requirements about the shape of the distributions from which samples are collected. Statistical properties of a sample, for example, mean or standard deviation, are called statistics. Statistical properties of a population or process are called parameters. Parametric tests, like t-tests, the z-test, and ANOVA, can only be used on data from populations or processes whose parameters conform to certain requirements. But non-parametric tests have no requirements on the parameters of the data. The most common parametric assumption is that a, a population of process from which the sample or samples are drawn must have properties where, which are at least roughly normal. In distributions like those shown here, the mean equals the mode, which also equals a median, and the skewness equals zero. That is, the shape is symmetrical. Non-parametric methods don't have those requirements on the data. Non-parametrics can work with data no matter how weird the shape of the distribution, even things like that shown here. Parametric methods, which use two or more samples from two different populations or processes, usually assume roughly equal variance. Non-parametric methods don't. Non-parametric methods are often called distribution-free because they are freed from any assumptions about the source distributions. Keto understanding number two says, Non-parametric methods convert measurement data into signs, ranks, signed ranks, or rank sums. 
one reason that non-parametric methods can use data from any distribution is that they usually don't work directly with the data. The sample data are converted to signs and or ranks, as we'll soon see, and the numerical value of the data are lost before any calculations are done. Calculations are done on the signs or ranks or signed ranks or rank sums, not on the data. So it makes no difference what type of distribution the source data have. We're going to describe in detail how this is done in several non-parametric tests, but you don't have to do all this manually. Just enter the data into software for the appropriate test and it will do the rest. Here we have an example using signs. We'll be comparing sample data to a value which we specify. That is what we do, for example, in a one-sample t-test. In this example, the value we specify is 30. The specified value could be a target value or a historical value or an industry standard and so on. In this example, 30 seconds is a historical median, median time to complete an operation in an industrial process. The second row shows the 10 time measurements in seconds in our sample. The values are 28, 31, 30, 33, etc. If a time is less than our historical median of 30 seconds, we give it a, a negative sign. If it is equal to 30 seconds, we give it a zero. If it is greater than that median of 30, and 30 seconds, we give it a plus sign. Next, we count the number of pluses and minuses. There are five pluses and three minuses. We can now use these counts, instead of the original data, in a non-parametric method called the sign test. Okay, that's how signs work. Now here's how ranks are used. Let's take the same sample of data and order it from low to high, as shown here. Next, assign a rank from low to high. The sample with a count of 27 is the smallest, so we'll give it a rank of 1. For ties, split the difference between the values tied. For example, there are two 28s. These occupy the two ranks after 1, a 2 and a 3, so we give them both a 2.5. The next rank would be a 4, but there's another tie, so we mark the next two as 4.5s, and so on. Signed ranks, as you might guess, combine the concepts of signs and ranks. But there is a change in how signs are assigned and absolute values are used, so we'll use a different example with some negative numbers. Let's see we are doing an analysis of the effect of a training program on employee productivity. If we were doing a parametric test, we'd use the paired t-test, which is also known as the dependent samples t-test. We count the number of transactions that the employees complete in an hour. For each employee, we subtract their score before training from their score after training. The data we are capturing is the difference. Now, instead of a plus and minus signs, we'll use plus one and zero. We compare the data values to a specified value, as we did in our example of a historical median of 30. Each sample data value is their, is their after production number minus their before number. We'll be testing a null hypothesis that there is a zero difference, so the specified value is zero. Step one, sign. For each data value, assign a sign. If the sign is greater than the specified value, which is zero in this example, then the sign equals plus one. If it's less than or equal to the specified value, then the sign equals zero. Step two is the absolute value. For step three, rank the absolute values to produce the absolute ranks. Step four, signed ranks. Multiply the sign times the absolute ranks. Signed rank tests are the non-parametric counterpart to the dependent samples t-test, which is also known as the paired samples t-test. Rank sum tests are the non-parametric counterpart uh, to the independent samples, aka two samples, t-test.
Now let's take a look at rank sum tests. We are comparing samples taken from two independent populations of processes. That is, the data values of one population are not influenced by the data values of another. Step 1. Group. Put all the data from both samples into a single group, but keep track of which ones came from which group. Step 2. Rank. Rank the values in the combined group. And step 3. Rank sum. Total the ranks for each sample. Key to understanding number three says, nonparametric methods can work with ordinal data, for example, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and nonparametric methods work with medians instead of means. Original data are non-numerical. They consist, I'm sorry, ordinal data are non-numerical. They consist of names and they imply an ordering, hence ordinal. For example, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, or very bad, bad, neutral, good, and very good. The names imply an ordering, but there are no corresponding numerical values upon which any calculations can be performed. Even if the names include numbers, for example, moving ratings of one, st one star to four stars, those numbers cannot be used in calculations. A four-star movie is not defined as 1.33 times as good as a three-star movie. The order in ordinal data is similar to the ranks in nonparametric NP statistics. So NP tests which use ranks are well suited for ordinal data. Means are normally used as a measure of central tendency in parametric tests. In converting the data to signs, ranks, etc., we lose the ability to calculate the mean. So we use the median instead. The median is another measure of central tendency. It is well suited for NP tests because it uses the numbers that rank in the middle. To determine the median, arrange the data values in order, low to high or high to low, high, high to low. For an odd number of data values, the median will be the middle value. For an even number, it will be the average of the two middle values. The median has some advantages over the mean. It is less influenced by outliers, and it is less influenced by the skew in skewed data. KTU number four says, nonparametric methods work better in dealing with outliers, skewed data, and small samples, but nonparametric methods have less power. Since nonparametrics and nonparametric NP methods use the median instead of the mean, they are better than parametric methods in minimizing the influence of outliers and skewed data. For that reason, in certain situations, the median is a more useful measure of central tendency than the mean. Here is an example. A couple is looking for a house in a community in which most houses are in the price range they can afford, say $400,000. They look at a report on recent home sales which show mean prices. One community shows a mean price of about $670,000, so they immediately exclude it from consideration. However, the underlying data show that five houses were sold for around $400,000, and one outlier was sold for two million. The median for the same numbers would be around 400,000, just what the couple was looking for. Similarly, for skewed data, the mean can be less meaning, a less meaningful measure in a practical sense than the median. Of course, with skewed data, the assumption of normality would not be met, so an NP method would need to be used in any event. For small sample sizes, it is not possible to accurately determine whether the distribution is normal. So a small sample size is a reason to use the NP method. Nonparametric methods can be used in any situation where a parametric method is used. The opposite is, of course, not true. So why wouldn't you use NP methods all the time? Well, NP methods have less power. This means that NP methods have a higher probability of a beta error, which is also known as a false negative error. NP methods have less ability to detect small differences, changes, or effects. 
A beta error is a false negative error, and beta is the probability of a beta error. Power equals 1 minus beta. It is the probability of not having a beta error, the probability of not having a false negative error. Lower power means that NP methods have a higher probability of beta error or false negative error than parametric methods. Also, lower power means a larger minimum effect size. Now, why is this the case? When non-parametric methods convert from measurement data to signs and ranks, for example, information, and thus precision, is lost. The third and fourth ranked measurements in the data may be 25 and 26, while the ninth and tenth ranked numbers may be 35 and 45. Ranks and sign would lose the information that the difference between the ninth and the tenth ranked numbers is ten times as much as the difference between the third and fourth. This reduction in precision is what causes the power of the test to be reduced in NP methods. Key to understanding number five. There are many non-parametric tests. This table shows some of the most common ones and what their parametric counterparts are. You may wish to pause the video to read them. That concludes our discussion of the non-parametric tests. This has been the sixth video in a playlist on statistical tests. You can always check the videos page of my website for the latest status of videos completed and planned. If you liked this video, please remember to press the thumbs up like button on your screen below. Now I'll be making more videos of some or most of the, of the um, 60 plus concepts in the book if folks like you tell me more videos are wanted. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, the website statisticsfromazz.com has a listing of available and planned videos. Now, videos like this one can be very helpful, but they're not, but they're not very handy when you want to quickly look up something on the job while studying or during an open book exam. For that, nothing beats a book or an ebook. You can also learn more about those on my website. I'd recommend following my blog at statisticsfromazz.com slash blog. I've got some things there that hopefully you will find interesting, like a statistics tip series, as well as posts showing that you are not alone if you're confused by statistics. I'll also be posting on the Facebook page, Statistics from A to Z, and on Twitter as at Stats A to Z.